Well, okay, so we are running a little bit late. So I think we'll just go until we have no more questions, but um, we have a couple questions, but do, does anybody want to ask a live question? Otherwise I'll start going through the list of ones I wrote down. No? So we have a couple questions for Udi. What is the harvest windows in Israel? When, for instance, would be your uh, Hass and Lamb Hass harvest windows? Our window starts more or less uh, end of September when we start with early varieties like Ettinger. Uh, and then we start the Hass normally end of October, beginning of November. And we can, uh, we can put it on the trees, leave it on the trees until end of March, beginning of April. Uh, we try to finish the harvest because the flower, before the flowering. So this is our main window for Hass. Lamb Hass is a more late variety. Uh, we harvest it around uh, mid-February to mid-March, more or less. Okay, great. And when you say that you use West Indian rootstock, which are the main West Indian rootstocks you use? The main one are probably uh, Ashdot 17 and Ganya 117. Uh, these are the most common one. Whenever we have also a problem of uh, high lime in the soil, we'll use Fairchild. Uh, but these are the, 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 let's say in the period that we had shortage, uh, which was the situation for us until about two years ago, uh, we had big shortage of West Indian rootstocks. People also used Ganya 62 and 399 and other West Indian rootstocks. But now when the, the rate of uh, planting is going down a little bit and the availability of uh, West Indian seed is, is improved. So most of the people uh, would use that. We are using on an on experimental basis, some uh, clonal rootstocks, which are West Indians. And there is probably two types trying to see if we can get better results. But I do have to say, uh, we, have, uh, we have all the time, uh, let's say in, ev in every new planting, uh, we try to have some uh, commercial experiments uh, to use in blocks, different varieties. Uh, we had one of our advisors, a guy named Hadar, uh, who is actually uh, uh, following all these uh, trials. And looking at this work for the last seven years, we cannot find any significant effect uh, of, the, of the rootstock on the productivity. You do find the effect when the salinity is changing or the, the, the type of soil, but when you find the, the correct uh, rootstock, uh, it doesn't have any effect on productivity based on our experience. Great. So, um... When you talk about NPK, there was a question earlier, is that really a PTO5 and K2O or? Again, what was the question? When you talk about phosphorus and potassium, or when you talk about the levels that you want, is it really in units of PTO5 and K2O? No, it's KTO. KTO. Okay. And then we had another question, is uh, water and technology development uh, for av the avocado industry is subsidized by the Israeli government at all? In fact, yes. I mean, all the, uh, all the technologies of uh, recycling water was actually financed. Uh, it's too big to put it on growers or, uh, or a farming industry. So most of the technologies involved in uh, purifying water and uh, treating it it was actually financed by the by the states, um, but now it, it's running and it's a, a commercial basis. So we have to pay for this water, which covers more or less, according to the, the law in Israel, it's the responsibility of the cities to purify the water because they are the one who producing the, the sewage water. But it's our responsibility to take it from them and to bring it to the fields, to the farming, uh, to the farms. So uh, it's quite expensive for us. We have to pay something like uh, for the recycled water, something like I would say 35 to 40 US cents per cubic meters. Uh, and if we have to use about 8,000 cubic meters per hectare per year, 
uh, you can figure out that it's one of our major, major expenses, uh, major uh, production cost in the, in the orchard. Uh, beside of water, actually the state today is not uh, investing too much money. We get some funds for R&D, but uh, most of the funds are coming from the growers. Okay, great. And then there was a question about like Pinkerton can be very necky when it's grown in hotter areas and you're growing it in the Sea of Galilee. Are you taking care of that neckiness by the use of the plant growth regulators or? Definitely. We can, we can grow Pinkerton without, without using uh, uniconazole. It's too necky. And uh, we actually developed the, the protocol for Pinkerton, the timing and the concentration. And, mostly in order to take care of the, the necky problem. Because Pinkerton is quite productive, but we cannot actually in our condition grow Pinkerton without these treatments. Okay, great. Uh, there was another question. Do you use Dusa rootstock in Israel? Hey, what? Dusa rootstock. Do you use Dusa in Israel at all? Oh, as a Dusa. No, no, we, we don't. We tried it in the past several times. Uh, I was quite surprised to hear from Guy that uh, Dusa is doing well with salinity uh, conditions. For us, uh, Dusa, uh, once the salinity was uh, like we have, let's say above 250 ppm of fluorides in the water. And, and the, another issue is that our soil pH is quite high. Our soil pH in the soil is moving from 7.2 to about uh, 7.8, even 8. Uh, pH, so DUSA was a total failure for us. We couldn't, uh, we still have it, but uh, it's not developing well at all. Fortunately, Phytophthora is not an issue for us again. So um, it's here, we tried it, it's not working. And uh, I, talking, uh, continuing on the topic of salinity guy, did I pick up in your slides that the main source of salinity in your area is not chloride, but a sodium? No, it's, it's, it's both. We have, um, it's old seabed. So we have both chloride and, and sodium. Um, they are sodic soils. So, you know, sodium is a problem. Um, and we do, you know, we, so for example, we, on, the, on my West Indian seedling blocks, the, the biggest thing that caused tree, trees to collapse was just being completely, um, the, the leaves being completely fried with the chloride. Um, so, for some reason, and you know, in certain conditions, certainly the conditions in, in North County, when the trial that was at, um, I'm trying to think now, uh, my brain's a bit rusty of all the growers' names, but um, he was chairman of the board of the commission. Um, you know, the big, the big salinity trial. That, Staley's. Staley's. That Staley's, yeah. Um, that uh, under those conditions, that those particular conditions, which the soil was quite, quite acidic, um, uh, but the, the water was very saline. Dusa did remarkably well. Um, I, I think where conditions are borderline, uh, you know, 6.5 pH and above, Dusa is not a suitable rootstock, uh, and it'll it won't do well at all. So um, it it really prefers acidic conditions, and 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 under those conditions, it will tolerate high salinity. And we see almost no. A salt burn on the Dusa rootstocks, particularly on on uh, lamb has and uh, and Maluma, we'll see a little bit on has, um, none on reed. Uh, but when we use other uh, rootstocks, so we we do use Bounty a bit just to have some um, uh, diversity amongst rootstocks, so we're not all of all of our eggs aren't in one basket. Um, there's considerably more uh, chloride burn on Bounty than there is on Dusa. But, but it still produces very well. And as you know, from California conditions, you can have quite substantial chloride burn before you see massive yield reduction. I mean, certainly by the end of winter, you normally see quite a bit of chloride burn. Mm -hmm. We had a question about how similar is the weather in the Southern Cape compared to California it would be more like, in my mind, it would be more like San Luis Obispo, Northern Santa Barbara County. It is so. Firstly, it's it's year-round rainfall, which is the big difference. Uh, we get rain um, distributed evenly throughout the year. Um, we'll, as I said in my in my talk, we'll get periods of of 
four to six weeks of no rain and then suddenly we'll get a deluge because we're halfway between the winter rainfall Mediterranean climate of Cape Town and the summer rainfall uh, sort of monsoon, if you like, uh, areas of, of Limpopo and Pumalanga and Natal. Uh, so we're halfway between. So our weather is very erratic. Um, and it is, we don't get the high temperatures. So when we do get uh, what we call berg winds, which are the Santa Ana winds of California, we very rarely uh, go above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, even though they, we, we consider them hot, dry winds, they're nothing like the hot, dry winds that you can experience in April and May in Southern California, where the temperature can be uh, well into the, the triple digits uh, in terms of Fahrenheit. So it's, it's a similar climate in some respects, but it's, it's not quite as, um, it doesn't have quite as, uh, uh, as wild a swings as California. I think because California is influenced by the continental um, weather patterns more than, than South Africa, which is you know, right on the tip of South Africa, particularly where we are. We influence more by maritime, non-continental weather patterns. And then I've been told that you're also that avocados are being planted in the Western Cape, like around Citrus Dahl, which is a historic Mediterranean naval orange Mediterranean area. Do you? No. How are they doing there? They're doing well. No, there are some very very successful growers there uh, as well. Uh, their their problem is alkaline soil, so their rootstock choices are, they they need to be looking at um, Israeli rootstocks, particularly fertile. Um, from what I've seen of Fairchild, it's, it does extremely well. And just the seedling population does extremely well um, in those conditions around citrus style and that. So uh, I think there's potential for, for using um, the rootstocks, the seedling lines that, that Israel has developed uh, in, in those, those kinds of areas where, where Dusa will not work, definitely won't work. And then... Um... The, uh, Gary Bender made a comment about that in California, pickers don't really like to have to walk up and down the ridges. Do you have that problem in uh, South Africa? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we will probably will have that problem. Our problem is on a Monday morning, nobody's sober. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So on a Monday morning, we're going to have a lot of people tripping down ridges, but probably uh, by Tuesday, they'll be, be upright again. Um, hey, look, guy. It is a concern. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hey, it's Hello. good to see you, guy. Uh, by the way, you, you know, the pickers on our high density, uh, we've had some guys up on ridges, and the pickers, you know, are, are picking from the ground. They're looking up in the tree. They're not looking down at their feet, and they're they're having a lot of trouble. In fact, we've, we've got labor problems here. So, uh, you, you know, I kind of wonder if that's going to develop on, on your – and maybe some other people uh, here have ridges too. I don't know. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, a, it's a very serious concern. You know, on, a, on the serious side, Gary, we, um, we are being audited just like everybody else in terms of, of Global Gap and, 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 you know, Tesco and all these other retail outlets that we have special things. Their auditors come and look at those kinds of things. Uh, you know, are we going to be accident prone in the future? And, and that will count against us. So we have to train the workers. We have to provide them with uh, adequate... So, we might actually end up having them be on sort of moving trailers with platforms that go along next to the tree and that the, the bins be on that trailer as part of the, the sort of the train that's going up the row. Um, and that's what we're looking very closely at. And there's been some very innovative designs on trailer designs so that the, the pickers actually aren't walking at all. They, they just sort of, there is the odd one that's going between the trees, but mostly they're picking from a platform that's right next to the tree that's going up between the ridges. Great idea. But yeah, there's, it, it's, going to be, it's going to be tough. I think all, all over the world, that kind of thing is, 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 is you know, California certainly is ahead of the curve, but, but uh, in terms of, of, of farm safety, but uh, it's, it's, it's on the radar everywhere now. So we had a question Gary, about- it's good, it's good to see Gary has a lot more hair than I do. <laughs> <laughs> so on the rich question again i think i'm not sure i understand this question from john cornell but what is the slope limit considered suitable for development to grow avocados in south africa we probably would not go beyond a 45 degree slope mary lou um and that would be it would have to be terraced 
uh, and it would have to be terraced on the contour. You couldn't, for example, do north-south facing rows or anything like that. So, so there is a limit. Um, we certainly haven't seen anything like uh, you know what what we see around Escondido in California in terms of of steep steepness of slope. Nobody has gone to that extent. But um, that slide that I showed you of the terraces on our farm, I think, is about as steep as we could go. Because you start losing um, uh, space, you having you having to to build uh, a terrace, you know, and the, then the the tree is sitting up sometimes three four meters up on the next terrace, and then you've got you know that tree's branches coming over the top of that precipitous slope. Uh, it, it, getting the fruit of those trees is going to be very difficult. So there is a limit. Certainly, is a limit to what you can plant on, and we don't. Yeah, you know, forty five degrees is a is a steep slope um and we certainly wouldn't go steeper than that mm. so there's another question in the south african high producing new orchards from former dairy farms is the soil rich from uh, cattle manure uh not you know these are our dairy farms are all um uh, it's not feedlot at all so these are are grazing dairy farms so it's not particularly influenced by that because you know obviously you're taking milk off the, the pastures were fertilized. They, they, they tend to be fairly high in potassium, but not particularly high in nitrogen. And um, they're not, uh, we don't do uh, very much high intensity uh, feedlot type dairy operations like you see in the Kern County, for example. Um, it's all, it's, it's, <laughs> we actually do have happy cows. <laughs> do you remember the holes? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. We have happy pigs it's, in California now, too. <laughs> um, so, with all the soil preparation, there's a question: Do you ever have to use chemicals for root rot? Uh, so far, no. So the only root rot has has shown up a positive just in one farm so far, uh, which is quite remarkable. We're not doing any uh, root rot treatment. So some guys will will put uh, phosphonate or Elliot down uh, at planting as a drench, but I don't think that's necessary. I think they are uh, that sort of prophylactic use of of materials is no not really uh, of any value. Look, we do have a, a serious problem in our industry in that uh, we are having MRL issues in the northern uh, parts of the industry from overuse of phosphonate. They are exceeding um, maximum uh, residue limits in in the fruit. Uh, I see, uh, you know, in my capacity working for Westphalia, I see. A number of, of fruit lots that get rejected because of of uh, MRLs or phosphonate, and interestingly, they they group you know phosphonates all together. Elliot is they consider exactly the same as potassium phosphonate, which I find quite remarkable. But that's a whole other topic. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, uh, do you get alternate bearing in German in uh, in South Africa? So yeah, so so the the, the the most, the highest alternation we've seen from any one year to the next in the mature gem was at Louis. That was from 17 and a half tons of per hectare of a low to 33 tons of a high. That was the biggest spread. But most of the time we're talking about, um, and, and I'm sure when you come to South Africa and you visit the area, there'll be a lot of discussion on this. We're talking about much smaller uh, variances, not, not, nothing like we see in Hass. Uh, we're getting much more even. Uh, and nothing like we see in lamb has. Lamb has is particularly bad at alternating. Um, gem seems to be much even. We, we, we're going somewhere, but I would say between 18 and 28 tons per hectare, quite consistently on the well-run orchards, which is very, very good. It's approaching, it's starting to approach those magic numbers that Carol came up with a few years ago. All right, so uh, Greg has his hand raised, Greg. Hi. Hi. Oh, there Greg. we go. Yeah, this is a question uh, related to Jim for a guy. With all of your wins, do you also battle the skin scarring on the gems? We do have some uh, and, and skin issues. You... Yeah. Yeah. So we we are we I packed uh, in our pack house gem for the first time. So it's the first time I've ever seen gem coming across a pack line. You know, for a long period of time, for for a couple of months. And um, 
uh, yeah, we we do have have issues like that. That that we fortunate in South Africa in that uh, we have a, a very at the time we packing gem we have a very good local market and in fact the biggest customer for gem which is is Woolworth um, has a moving target when it comes to fruit quality and and blemishes and marks and they they accept at the time we packing they accept quite a lot up to fifty percent. Uh, um, of the surface can be damaged by wind. However, um, oh, wow. I think uh, we are going to go to uh, much more difficult as more and more gem comes in the market, it's going to be more difficult. And I think um, we're going to seriously have to look at uh, how much wind damage we have. I was in an orchard this afternoon down the Eastern Cape uh, where they, they don't have wind breaks and have a lot of wind. And I could see quite a bit of wind damage, but because the fruit is held inside the tree, there's still a good proportion that's um, scar free that will go, uh, you know, what we call export number one. Great. John, oh. I see you have your hand raised. Oh, Greg, are you finished? I didn't mean to cut you off. John? Um, hi, Guy. Um, hi, John. Just, just a quick question. Most of the success, it's, it appears, that you're experiencing there. In South Africa is based on the um, uh, the pre-planting, uh, the things you do to the soil and the planting. Um, for groves that uh, are already established and experiencing low yields, uh, what what lessons or, or what suggestions might you make to growers that are in that category? Wow, that's a that's a very good question, John. Um, well, you know, the guys up uh, in the northern part of our industry are doing some experience experiments now on that exact thing. Um, as you know, avocado trees hate to uh, have soil move too much around them uh, when they are mature. Uh, but one of the approaches, um, certainly around uh, the Zanin Nelspate area in the old orchards, has been to go down this between the, the rows of trees with a, a deep ripper. Uh, to 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 go down to uh, you know one one point two meters one point five meters with a uh, with a you know big bulldozer with a ripper uh, to break the soil between uh, between the rows of trees and then to come in the next year and actually with a grader grade out some of the soil and start ridging it up uh, against the tree the, the danger of that is is that you you tend to uh, put a uh, part of the root system in um, anaerobic conditions and the trees initially show some some shock. But I've seen some quite remarkable turnarounds of low producing, particularly 40 orchards in where they've done this, where they've first done the deep ripping between the rows. Uh, that's just to introduce some, you know, some some breaks in the in the uh, layers of soil and and increase some some oxygen to deep down. Um, and then, and then this this moving of soil from the middle between the the, the trees, uh, sort of up against the trees, um, some some remarkable turnaround. Yeah, so so I think we in early days of doing that, but I think the guys up in the north have seen how much ridging has helped, uh, and some guys, John, are going overboard. I mean, I'm seeing ridges now that are three meters wide at the top and are probably. Uh, 1.5 meters high from the base, which, uh, you know, is like a mountain. Um, I think Mary Lou's probably seen this uh, uh, in South Africa too around Zanin. The guys have gone overboard with the size of their ridges. And I'm worried with that exact issue that Gary brought up on worker safety, that we'll have an issue later on down the road. But let's see. So we have uh, Robert <laughs> guy, Jackson. Oh, sorry. No, the guys, are, the guys, one of the wisest things that have ever been said to me was by, by Louis Forster, who said, um, Guy, you only have one chance to get it right before planting. Do everything you can to improve the, the soil conditions. Because once the tree's in the ground, there's not much you can do. Yeah, that's, that's good advice. Uh, Robert Jackson has a question. What kind of delta are you seeing uh, between the return to growers for Hass on one hand versus Jim on the other? Uh, that's a very good question. Look, at the moment, Jim does does very, very well. Uh, you know, it's got some exclusive markets. The volumes aren't, aren't terribly big. 
and uh, there's a good demand for gem. I worry, I'll be honest with you, I worry about uh, some post harvest issue, post harvest issues with gem, including stem and rot. Uh, if we can get a handle of that, I think gem uh, is an absolute winner. The reason is, is that gem, um, you know, doesn't have a, a small fruit problem like has. So you, you're not going to end up with 30% of the fruit being too small to pack. On the flip side of that, gem does have a large fruit problem. And while the trees are young, uh, if you don't have a specialized market that will accept big size fruit, and I'm talking, uh, uh, you know, stuff that's 350 to 450 grams. Um, so that, that's it, for it, everybody, that's, that's, that's a very large fruit. That would be a size 30, 30 I mean, a size 30, 28 or 32. Yeah, it's very large fruit, and 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 we do see that on the young trees, particularly where we are. We we have a bad fruit size distribution, tending to jumbos, which we call oversized, which actually have no market, and they get sent to to processing, oil processing in the in the early days. But the trees calm down. I think Mary Lou will agree with this. I think the oldest gem trees in California, if you look at the stuff that's in the breeding blocks, the fruit size distribution gets much more tempered. The same can be said for lamb has. Um, we have a terrible problem with the fruit being too big in lamb has early on and maluma, uh, but the trees calm down uh, as they reach uh, probably year six and seven, the sixth and seventh harvest and, and beyond. The fruit size tends to be much better. Uh, but but yeah, in terms of the, of, the, of the profitability, I think right now, Jim, Jim is certainly because of the yields, uh, uh, you know, if I compare a 12 year old gem to a 12 year old Hass orchard, uh, they're significant, significantly more profitable gems. For us, I'm not, I, I can't, can't talk for the, for the California market or the, the US market. Um, but for the specialty uh, retailers, they, they like gem, they like it if the quality is good. We've just been through a rough season. So um, I think I'm a little bit, uh, I've become a little wary of particularly stem end rots. And I've been meaning to actually to, to talk to Mary Lou about it and see if there isn't anything we should be doing in the field to reduce them and rot, whether it be the way we harvest or the conditions we're harvesting in. Um, but we had up to 30% of the, the fruit showing stem and rot um, on inspection uh, when it's arrived overseas and also in, in the local market. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. So we have two years of storage data where we have it compared to Haas and other things from the breeding program. And I would not say that it's any worse than anything else. It might just be that we've we've we in yeah you know, we're in a area where most of the early plantings were gem, and so we're seeing big volumes you now. Yeah, but the other thing is you need to look at is what is the semen rot organism that's causing the mm. semen rot. There might be something local. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of variability. Um, so. Before I go to Greg, I have one other question for you about Jim. Here in California, in my opinion, unfortunately, people now are thinking that they can hold Jim much longer than Hass. What's your opinion? No, so that's a very interesting question. Mary Lou, we packed uh, Jim and Hass all the way into uh, the third week of January. So it's extremely late for South Africa because our first early fruit comes off on the 1st of February. Um, and in my opinion, the very, very late season has was better quality than the gem. Um, according to Louis, who grows both and has grown them, grown them the longest, Louis Forster, uh, he's, he keeps cautioning me not to call gem uh, a, a late has. And, and he says that if you look at the dry matters where we are, they track very nearly uh, uh, equally. Um, uh, week by week uh, where we are. And in fact, there doesn't seem to be even a three week adv advantage uh, of gem in lateness versus has. I'm not sure that that's necessarily sh so because um, I think in that period uh, where gem is at its peak, um, certainly where we are, uh, uh, most of the has is, has already gone. So I can't really say that, but, but I did, pack from the same grower uh, blocks that were very close by on the same rootstock um, this season and in that last two weeks of January the, the has looked better and actually returned a premium because there was no has on the market 
uh, on, even in the international market, there was a shortage at that time in that second mm-hmm. week of January. So, so on the European market, we did very, very well on, we did better on the house than we did on the gym. And do the fruit turn black on the tree? They do, on the young trees particularly. We have mm-hmm. at least, uh, so we, we do harvest the, that fruit first, uh, just because we think it's an indicator of maturity. Um, but by the end of the, and, and this is, and I think this is exactly what you're alluding to, by the end of that period or where we, the, the gem harvest, when we're picking that last fruit and you compare it to that late, very, very late house that we're picking, while the very late house was, was testing about 34% dry matter, which you know is getting to that point where it's crumbly, it's not actually the best eating quality. The external quality still remains beautiful. It's emerald green, um, no, no color development. Uh, versus the gem, which by then at that very, very late season stuff, it's mostly dark. Yeah, that, well, that's what we see is that normally when we've been doing storage work, both for both house and gem, because in Irvine, we get both of them turned black. But I would yeah. say you're right. The gem turns black sooner and more intensely. But as soon as you see, start seeing fruit coloring on the tree, the fruit quality on both varieties takes a nosedive. Yes, yes. Yeah, so Greg, I think we've got a, oh, I'm sorry. No, I think we've got a lot of young trees. Uh, there's a lot of young gem, or tr- gem coming off of young trees. And the yields on those young trees, as you know, Mary Lou, are astounding. I mean, uh, in the third year, we're getting five, six tons a hectare, uh, three years after planting. And then it goes up very rapidly from there. So we've got a lot of, gem fruit coming in from trees that haven't settled down yet. It's hard to judge, compare quality on those trees. Yeah. Has, has a much more moderate producer, even on the young trees. It, it's a moderate producer and it tends to be a, it's not a calm grow. It grows very vigorously, <clears throat> but it, <clears throat> I don't know, it's fruit just seems calmer. I, I always feel like I'm, when the has, and the, when the lamb has and the gem are going across the line, it, it seems chaotic to me because everyone's pulling stuff out and <clears throat> the house seems a little bit more control. But we don't have, a, because we don't have high temperatures where we are, we don't have this small fruit problem where we are. At. That's really limited to the northern areas. Okay, so I, I apologize to Greg. So please, Greg, ask your question. <laughs> That's okay. I actually, it, it reminded me of another question I had about Jim do you in uh in south africa or anywhere else uh selectively pick any gem trees based on color for example or are they just always strip picked no we we pick by color first so we'll we will pick off all the the colored fruits starting where we are we will start in uh probably in the middle of november uh, taking off the the colored fruit um, and the, the gem harvest carries on all the way to the middle of January, but um, we'll probably do two picks of all the colored fruit first, the, the highly colored fruit, and then uh, come in and strip pick on the third pick. Thanks. Um, the, the other question I had was related to your, um, where do you get your targets for soil preparation in terms of pH and nutrients and um, and other amendments, uh, are they are they anywhere <laughs> are they anywhere that I could uh, refer to? Yeah, I can I can certainly send you the sort of the the, the, the printouts. We do have targets um, based on um, uh, what what we call as the industry benchmarking. Uh, so so. Um, there, there are there's industry-wide collection of data on soil and leaf analysis as well as yield, uh, and that and that benchmarking is used then by the uh, companies that help us with uh, doing the soil sampling and, and leaf analysis and interpreting the results on how we should uh, add ameliorants to the soil. As you know, and I'm sure you appreciate, is it, it's a tricky path because uh, you know you've got people selling products. Uh, uh, they are qu- quite aggressively and um, you know, you've got the science. So there's sort of a mixture between the two. I like to uh, 
I'm, I'm constantly reining in the salesmen on on their overzealous uh, recommendations for for what should be thrown into the pot. Uh, and often I, I I will meet with a grower and say, no, take this out, take this out, take this out. You being, you know, this is all fluff, and we do get fluff thrown in. I mean, because it's the nature of business for for the guys selling fertilizers to throw in that fluff. I mean, Gary's had given some great talks on that, uh, I think, over the years, Gary Bender uh, and, and Ben too. Um, we always used to laugh as farm advisors on how much stuff that growers had to sort through. Well, not laugh, but be amazed at how much stuff growers had to sort through because there's so much pressure I mean, put on them to, to, you know, to buy things that may or may not work. But, but we, do, we do have benchmarking and, and for the most part, those, the, 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 the system that we're using is working very well. So I, I can send that to you. No. Those were great I mean, questions. I, 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 yeah, I remember in, in California being very frustrated when I would meet with a grower and they would have a printout from, from a lab and it had their, their results of their, their leaf and soil analyses, but no interpretation at all. And it was left to the farmer and the farm advisor to do the interpretation. Uh, when you know some of these labs have hundreds of thousands of samples coming through and haven't benchmarked those against yield and the rest of it. But I think I think that's probably changed in California, right, Gary? Yeah, I had a question for both Udi and Guy um, on nitrogen, on nitrogen in the leaf analysis. Um, mm. You know, the, the California standards are fairly low and the Australian standards are, I think, about 2.6, if I remember right. And that, when we did our high density, you know, the highest yield yielding year we had, we had 2.9% in our in our leaves by, by a, sheer accident. And I think Udi mentioned that they were going to start doing some research on looking at higher nitrogen levels. And, um, and maybe Mary Lou can chime in on that, too, because it, that concerns me a little bit. I, I, I've got something. If I can quickly mention something, Gary. Um, I was just at the South African Avocado Growers Association uh, research meetings, and there is a, a researcher who's been gathering all of this data on, on yield and uh, nitrogen levels. And he presented the most intriguing scatter plot I've ever seen. Well, not ever seen, but I'm exaggerating. But it showed nitrogen, uh, 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 you know, yield versus uh, uh, percentage N in the leaves. And from 1.8 to 2.8, there isn't a pattern. They all, at 1.8, there was a, an orchard that high, had amongst the highest production. And at 2.8, it was identical and everywhere in between. The scatter plot below 1.8, it drops off like a, a drop, but drops off like a precipice. Above 2.8, it drops off like a precipice. But in that window, you could not see a pattern. So, um, I was fascinated. In fact, when I looked at all the scatter plots, you know, you, you really you realize that um, we, we are, in my opinion, we've probably been in luxury levels of, of N, P, and K, and, and many of the other nutrients, uh, just because we, we can. It was, you know, we, we, we could afford to put it on the orchards. But um, I, I must, must say, I prefer the California approach from what I remember. I, I prefer to be in that 1.8 to 2.2 range. I think your fruit quality is much better um, in that range. And I think one of the reasons that we've sort of had this bit of a, uh, a train wreck uh, with gem quality this past year, and particularly uh, semen rot, is I think the, the fruit was just much more tender and more susceptible to 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 post-harvest problems because it was so high in N. That's and we are very high in N. So I, 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 I would make a comment. So we, I mean, I, yeah. I'll let Uri talk, but I mean, I think we need to think about the work that Zelda von Ruin did on Pinkerton and Haas for a master's and PhD. And uh, that show, and the work that Peter Hoffman led in, in Australia. And definitely, you you know, you have to look at more than yield. So the, it, yeah. it's definitely clear that when you go start going up above two and a half, two point six percent leaf end, you're compromising the quality of the fruit, the post harvest quality of the fruit. And and the work that Peter Hoffman did definitely showed that when you were in high nitrogen, you got a lot more decay. 
So, you know, we have to be very mindful. I would agree with you, you know, I mean, I don't know if I would go down to 1.8, the data we got from cash and would not support 1.8% leaf end for Hass at least. But, you know, in the it, between two, two and a half, you're in a good range. And um, we have to be thinking about fruit quality and uh, high nitrogen fruit just do not have the storage. Even, un, even California fruit under California marketing conditions, they don't have the legs that a fruit when you when you're coming from a high nitrogen uh, situation, but let's see what Udi has to say. To comment to that, first of all, I agree about the issue of the fruit quality. Definitely, uh, we start to collect now a lot of data uh, of, uh, and we did do it in the past. But we are analyzing fruit pulp today uh, to check the nitrogen and the calcium, and definitely you can start see, especially where you are short in calcium and high nitrogen, it start to push you into uh, quality issues. But I really think that, that this is a tricky issue of the, of the level of nitrogen in the leaves. It's a very, it's a very uh, how to say, it, focus in, in growing conditions. And I think it's going to be difficult to start to study from one place to the other. Uh, so for example, um, if you go to the tropical areas of Australia, or if you go to the, I don't know very well, the south part that the guy is talking about, the south part of South Africa, but we're going to Limpopo to Zenin area, you can easily find levels of 2.6, 2.7, 2.8, uh, even 3% nitrogen with good production. Uh, in Israel, we're struggling to go over the 2%. And, and uh, let's say if we want to go into levels of 2.2, 2.4, we need to, uh, to increase the application of nitrogen. And I'm not sure it's, it's the same story for other uh, growing conditions. What I mentioned is that up till now, uh, with this uh, common practice of applying 200, 250 kilos of N per hectare per year and living on an average of 1.8 to 2, we get what we get. And we believe that maybe going into like, maybe 400 kilos of uh, N per year and climbing to 2.2 to 2.4, uh, it can help us to uh, to break this uh, ceiling that we have with production and maybe to go to in the trade. I'm saying we, we think about it because we haven't proven it yet, but we are focused on that and try to, to see if it can work. So I'm, I hopefully Francisco Mena hasn't fallen asleep, but I know that Francisco Mena has done a lot of work with nitrogen in Chile. Could you share? Some of your May, thoughts, Francisco? May, May Lou, could I interrupt? Uh, sorry, yes. I really apologize. I need to get on the road. I've uh, got about a two hour drive and it, it gets uh -oh. quite dangerous as it gets dark. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I, I apologize to everybody. This is a fantastic discussion and I can't wait to listen to the rest of it uh, uh, on, the, on the recording. Um, but I must uh, um, regret that I, I need to, to get on the road. I've got two other passengers with me and they're getting very impatient. They say that the, the bed and breakfast is going to close. They're going to close the doors and we won't get in. So um, I'm going to have to say uh, goodbye and thank you so much for having me on. And I really thank appreciate you. it. I'm sure so everybody nice to enjoyed see, seeing you again and seeing all these see familiar you in faces. South Africa in 2027. Uh, I can't, to see, can't wait to see all of you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks. So Francisco, do you want to make a, a comment or two about nitrogen? Um, basically, we were at some point uh, working with about uh, 300 Ks or, or a little bit more of, uh, of, of nitrogen, but uh, we've been moving down basically because we started working with uh, organic amendments and uh, all of our root systems got such a big improvement that uh, for at least two, two or three years, we've been all been pushing nitrogen down to probably 30 to 40 uh, percent. And, and, and the trees look even more vigorous than what they did look when they, we were pushing that much, that much nitrogen. So uh, I think uh, for us, it's been a journey in which we went up and right now we're, we're going down again. And, 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 and I've, Kind of agree with what Udi was saying that maybe in, in some 
climatic conditions like Chile, like Israel, where you don't get the amount of rain that you get in other parts of the world, you can get away with higher nitrogen in your in your pulp or with lower calcium. It doesn't it doesn't change much. We've tried that for several seasons and 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 food quality didn't change. I think that there's a big relationship with with uh, uh, how exposed to uh, high rainfall the fruit is when you need the, the, the fruit to have those uh, high levels of calcium or lower levels of nitrogen. Thank you. And 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 on the other hand, I, I remember that there's there's a, a research that uh, has been going uh, on in in Israel uh, uh, regarding um, uh, nutrition, and and I believe that uh, that's the same question that we've made ourselves and we've been making ourselves for for already uh, a couple of months. Is uh, it's about timing. Uh, we we believe that uh, we need to try to push more into times where we're not used to put nitrogen in, like uh, late autumn or early winter, especially as we don't have the, the rainfall uh, in the past years. Uh, we've been seeing uh, that the trees have a much better spring uh, outbreak. And also when you are working with high salinity levels, leaf drop doesn't come as early uh, as it usually does when you're pushing nitrogen a little bit more into the winter. That's a good point. To, to come to that, Francisco, I, I totally agree with what you just said. And that's why we are going now into this work, trying to check uh, nutrition through the rainy season. The problem is that working like that makes nutrition very inefficient because you're working yeah. through a cold season, the soil, the soil temperature is low. And on the other hand, the cost of fertilizers went up in Israel with about 25%. So coming to the growers and with this uh, situation, but anyway, we are going to check it. Yeah, right. I, I think it's worth trying. You know what? Take a look at it and see and see what happens. Because whenever we done test trials and and, and seeing it, 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 it seems to seems to work. When you go back and you talk to Iñaki or Masa, when Iñaki did all the trials regarding fruit set and starch content in the flowers that were were setting. Uh, they realized that they needed more starch on the flowers and, and, and they told the growers that they needed to put more nitrogen into, let's say, late, late autumn rather than early winter, but, but it's at this stage of the, of, of, of the crop. Very good points. Do we have, we're run, we've run a half hour over. Do we have any other questions? I know that everybody has things to do and it's very late at night now for Udi. We saw the guy had to leave to get his hotel room. Uh, any more questions? I don't see any. So I want to thank you, Udi. I want to thank everybody who stayed until the end. And, uh, Let's take the break. You bet. We're going to take. And uh, really appreciate you taking the time, sharing your thoughts and knowledge about the Israeli avocado industry. I'm sure that there were a lot of good points that some of us took away. Awesome. Thank you, Mary Lou, and everyone. Very good conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And you are only invited for a visit. So uh, we are here. Bye -bye. On the way to South Africa in 2027. Mm -hmm. bye -bye. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. bye.